Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, A Crystal Ball for Your Manufacturing Data. Uh, as with all webinars, we're going to wait a minute or two to give people a chance to log in. So, you know, sing yourself some elevator music or hold music, and then uh, we'll get back to you in about a minute, okay? Alrighty, let's get started. Uh, my name is Laura Mayhew, and I'm a member of the Infinity QS marketing team. I'm gonna be your host today, and I'm super excited to kick things off. Uh, but before we begin, let's review a few housekeeping items. Uh, the webinar is gonna last about 45 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, if you wanna submit questions, you can use this handy question feature that you see on screen to submit any, uh, anything you wanna know more about. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. This event is being recorded and we will send you a playback link soon. And please feel free to share it with your colleagues or anyone else who you think would be interested. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. How companies use their quality data today, how companies could better use their quality data, the data they already collect. We're gonna share a few super compelling customer stories to bring everything to life. Then we're gonna explain how you can translate their success to become your success. And finally, as I said before, we're gonna conclude with a Q&A session. And now for introductions, I am honored to introduce our beloved speaker for today, Mr. Douglas Fair. Doug is the Chief Operating Officer at Infinity QS and has been with the company since 1997. Yes, I said 1997. Uh, Doug brings with him more than 30 years of deep experience in manufacturing, analytics, and statistical applications. He has a BS in industrial statistics from the University of Tennessee and has a Six Sigma black belt from the University of Wisconsin. Doug serves as a senior member of the American Society for Quality and he has co-authored two books, not one, two on industrial statistics. And yes, they are available on amazon.com. Just search Douglas Fair. Despite all these accomplishments, Doug's absolute biggest strength and clearly the biggest benefit to both Infinity QS and our customers is his deep passion for analytics, statistics, and manufacturing. This, coupled with Doug's extensive shop floor experience, makes him the full meal deal and an invaluable contributor at Infinity QS. So, with all that said, Doug, take it away. Thank you, Laura, for that wonderful introduction. And good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Doug Fair here. I just want to share with you what I think is a very compelling presentation. Let's start first with the purpose of this webinar. The purpose of this webinar is what? It's to inspire you. It's meant to inspire you to transform your production shop floor data into valuable, actionable information. Why? Well, so you can improve overall quality performance at your plant or across your company. So you can lower your costs of quality. And so ultimately you can delight your customers with the quality of the products that you're manufacturing. If you are currently an Infinity QS client, I wanna be clear, you already have the tools you need to transform your quality performance in your plants using our software. Everything I'm going to cover today is supported in your Infinity QS software. So some of you might be wondering about this analogy we're using about a crystal ball. Well, I think it's apt. I think that using Infinity QS software is just like using a crystal ball for your manufacturing data. Now let's think about that. Consider, consider any movie that you've seen that includes someone that's reading a crystal ball. Okay, usually the scene is this. There's, there's a bunch of people sitting around a table and then there's this mysterious person who's reading the crystal ball. But the reading only occurs after the reader has spoken with the attendees and has carefully observed those attendees. In other words, the reader gathers data from the attendees before communicating what is seen in the crystal ball. Now let's talk a little more about that mysterious person. First, 
The crystal ball reader seems to have this uncanny ability to convert observable facts into information. Second, the reader sees things others cannot. Why? Well, because the crystal ball itself summarizes and with surprisingly accurate detail, it, it summarizes very specific information about the attendees present, past, and even future. In summary, the reader has this amazing ability to divine valuable facts and information simply by gazing into a crystal ball. And in that entire description, I would say that our software, we call it Enact, our software is indeed a crystal ball in all of those regards. So like the person who sits and reads a crystal ball at that table, Infinity QS software has an uncanny ability to reveal previously unknown information, right? And, and Enact also has the ability to, to learn and present to you information about your present, about your manufacturing past, and yes, even have a prediction for future performance in your manufacturing operations. And ACT exposes important information about your processes that likely you have never been aware of previously. And I'm saying that, and that may sound weird to you, but I'm saying that because I have extensive experience with that with so many of our clients who said it. And ACT also allows you to learn things that will surprise you, but not only surprise you, but could also save you millions of dollars even tens of millions of dollars, like two of the examples I'm gonna share with you in just a moment. But, but there's something, something huge that stands in the way of your success. It stands in the way of every quality professional's or manager's success in this regard. It's a huge problem, a huge problem, and I want to discuss it briefly. What is this huge problem? What's this? The big problem is that almost all quality data, even almost all manufacturing data, dies in some IT system somewhere in your system. You see, today, modern manufacturing plants gather gigabytes of production and quality data every single day. The question is, what do you do with it all? I mean, think about it. For those of you who have experience on the shop floor, where does all that PLC data go? How often do you look at it? What other data do you have that simply inaccessible or just being collected for the sake of being collected. I, I gotta say, I, I hate to report this, but my experience over the last quarter century is this. The overwhelming majority of all collected data that organizations collect in manufacturing environments, it's simply ignored. And I'm not overstating this concern. Companies spend millions of dollars on data collection equipment only to fail to optimize that information fail to get information from the systems they've just spent a lot of money on. I believe that databases have become the modern equivalent of graveyards for quality and manufacturing data. Hands down, the biggest problem with quality data is simply dies a silent death in some database somewhere never to be seen again. And that's tragic, guys, because there's value in that data. Not only are these expensive data collection systems undervalued, not only are they underused, but here's the thing, they are chock full of immensely valuable information. But most organizations ignore that data. And if you're a representative of a company that says, you know, we really don't have any problems at our company, we really don't make anything that's out of spec. Don't think there aren't great opportunities for doing great things, improvements, cutting costs, even with data that's in spec. Because I'm here to tell you, there's enormous value from data uh, that, that's actually within specification limits. That's not a problem. And I know that sounds weird, but I'm gonna share with you two examples of that specifically. You see today, most organizations are just too busy to bother with that data. They ignore the data and they ignore the information that that data could generate. Why? Why? Why is it? I've seen this over and over again. In my 35 years as a quality professional, I see it over and over and over again. The reason why the data is ignored is because of the daily quality fire drill. You know what I'm talking about. The problems that bedevil organizations every single day on the shop floor, every single shift on the shop floor. You've got a production line that goes down. You've got supplied products that don't meet your specifications. You've got a products that go out of specification. You've got compliance errors, whatever it is, these daily fire drills just 
they usurp the, the time and the effort of your quality professionals, your operators, your managers, your engineers, and they descend, and you should do this, you descend on the problem and fix it, but because of all that time and energy spent fixing quality problems on a daily basis, there's this lack of strategic intent in how to deal with the data that you collect every single day. Let me say that again. There's a lack of strategic intent to manage and deal with, and yes, learn from the data that you collect every single day, even if it's in spec. Now, what we recommend is leveraging the data that you already collect. I'm guessing here that the majority of you work for organizations that collect data and it goes into some database somewhere, again, never to be seen again. If you're gonna spend thousands of, day, of, of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions of dollars of modernizing data capture, why not leverage it? Why not use it strategically to improve efficiencies and reduce costs? Unfortunately, again, data collection systems today are undervalued. However, today's four success stories are based on leading edge companies who leveraged their quality data and made incredible improvements in their processes and, and, and products. To be clear, the success stories that I'm gonna share with you are about strategically leveraging data. This data can help you to improve operational efficiencies, reduce quality costs, and these leading edge companies did some great things. They all leveraged their quality data and made, I'm gonna say incredible, and I did use the word transformative improvements. And rest assured, these are not generic third party uh, examples. I was personally involved in every one of these success stories. Um, data was used in each of these success stories to guide very deliberate, very calculated actions to make great improvements in the processes that they were dealing with. So, so again, I, I lived through the frustration, the unhappiness, the angst, and yes, the successes of each of these, and I'll share some of that detail with you. And the way that we basically we were able to uh, <laughs> make these improvements is because we used Infinity QS software as a crystal ball to look at their data. We peered into their data and got information from it. So peering into data, what's it do for you? It allows you to discover. Make discoveries you didn't know were there and pinpoint the greatest opportunities for improvement, not just at the plant level, but potentially across your enterprise. And once you have those discoveries, you can prioritize them and figure out what needs to be fixed now, later, and so forth. And once you have that information, you can act on it. I like to say we're able to convert data into manufacturing intelligence. And it's unfortunate that I hear this too often. I hear that uh, some of our clients will say, hey, we had no idea that your software could do that. In other words, they aren't necessarily leveraging the strategic capabilities of our software to make higher level transformative improvements in their manufacturing operations. The reason why is this, is, and you probably know this, any, any organization who wants to use a quality system like ours or some other, you're very excited to get it installed and, uh, and working on the shop floor. And once you've done that, then what you wanna do is, is you, want to, you wanna collect data. And once you've collected data, then I've seen too many companies do that. They all celebrate, they go wahoo, we're, we're collecting data, everyone celebrates, and they say, okay, what's next on our to-do list? I wanna tell you that just collecting data, that is, not, that is not the end, it is not the goal, it is simply a means to an end. The end is being able to transform your quality performance. And just collecting data will not allow you to do that. You've got to interrogate the data. You've got to use the data strategically. So these are some of the things that the people and organizations want to be able to do. For example, we look at quality engineers. They want to target shop floor fixes. They want to stop problems before they grow. They want to spot trends and act. Again, these, these great ideas are impeded by the fact that there's too many quality fires out there, too many, too many things in the moment distract and consume time for these quality engineers. Now, secondly, Six Sigma and quality teams, well, what do they want to do? Well, they want to reduce overall costs. They want to improve quality across the corporation, and they want to make large scale improvements for their organization. But again, too many quality fires take too much time away from fixing and preventing issues. Now, plant managers, what, the, what do they want to do? They want to improve plant efficiencies, of course. They want to reduce unnecessary costs, of course. They want to increase throughput, of course, and maximize uptime. Again, 
the fires being fought every day, the production lines that go down, the supply issues, all those things impede the ability to make great improvements. But if you can make great improvements, if you can use your data strategically, everyone benefits. Your employees, your brand, your customers, the long-term viability of your business, and of course, your company's bottom line. So let's jump into it. Let's talk about some of those benefits, some of the ways that organizations have beneficially used this data in a very strategic manner. Our first case study has to do with an aerospace organization. Now, this company made very large products, and I'm not, I, I'm not gonna talk about the company name or who they were or anything like that, but here's the thing. Nearly half of the products that they were making were out of specification, 45%. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Imagine that your organization was generating of all the products being made on the shop floor, almost half were out of spec, couldn't be sold. Imagine if that was the case. Wow, that would be a real problem. In fact, they had a real problem. The scrap that they counted was in the tens of millions of dollars. It was a massive problem. But And also, there's no visibility into what was causing these problems. So, and just understand, these were very intelligent people. Aerospace engineers, quality engineers, plant managers with with decades of experience. I mean, these are people that were saying, holy smokes, we're smart guys, we just, we just don't know what's going on. We can't figure this out. We need to prevent this from happening. So we got the phone call and I worked very closely with this organization and um, we, we, really did, we really dialed it in. But I wanna give you an idea of the scale of this manufacturing uh, plant. So everyone's ever seen you know, tractor trailers out there on the interstate. Just take a look at this, that, that orange vehicle, that's the tractor. That's what pulls the trailer on the interstate. I want you to imagine a manufacturing machine that's the size of this tractor. And it'd be wrong. The milling machine that was used to cut these very detailed aerospace parts, the milling mach the machine itself was larger than this tractor. And quite literally, it was like a tractor because and I'm not exaggerating here, the operator of this machine literally had to climb up into a cab that had a windshield like this and quite literally had a steering wheel. The operator literally would drive this multi-spindle milling machine across the workpiece so that the product was, that's how they made these products. They were big pieces, of, of metal and they cut them and the, the, the scale here is amazing. So the operators drove the mill across the, 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 across the workpiece, enormous scale, the challenges were extraordinary. So what happened? Well, we gathered data. That's the first thing we focused on was, hey, let's gather data into our Infinity QS software. We helped them do that. We worked with the operators, inspectors, the engineers, the project leaders, all that stuff. And what we did is we transformed that collected data into actionable information. What do we act upon? Well, the, the data revealed information to these guys. It revealed the, the locations of where their biggest problems were on these products they were, they were manufacturing. And it revealed root causes of those issues. Now, here's the crazy thing is that within 60 days, all out of specification issues were eliminated, all of them, from 45% out of spec to zero in two months. So the plant throughput increased strangely by 60%. This was, this was an unanticipated benefit. The plant manager and even vice presidents for this company came to the shop floor and said, what is going on? We're seeing whatever you're doing here, we're seeing it on the bottom line right now, within two months. Because you imagine if they had tens of millions of dollars of product going out of spec and they eliminated that, Wow, that's good. But then the plant throughput itself increased by 60%, nearly 60%, because they didn't have to rework stuff. They didn't have to put it aside and manage it and, and throw time and attention at it. And all the stuff that was problematic, those problems went away. And their throughput increased. It, it was just amazing. And with our software, using it as a crystal ball through which we viewed their manufacturing data, they said this. <laughs> it was kind of funny. They said, you know what, Doug, you know more about our manufacturing operations than we do. Now, I called a timeout on that and I said, no, no, I don't. I don't know your manufacturing operation. You guys know it better than I do. All I'm doing is divining information from the data you have already collected. And I shared with them the ways that they could do it themselves. We taught them to fish, if you will. And it was absolutely brilliant. They were completely shocked with the success of this particular example. It was, again, tens of millions of dollars of savings. And it was, it was super exciting. 
Let's talk about another case study. Now this case study is a totally different business. This was spirits bottling. What you see there is a bottling machine in the background. It's a multi-head bottling machine. And uh, what we did is we we're helping this client to just deploy across a single production line. Now the reason why they wanted to do this was because they just wanted to make sure, they wanted to verify that our software could do all the many things that they wanted to be able to do from a quality perspective on the shop floor. And there was a ton of checks that we did that we helped them with, for example, HACCP and sanitation, compliance regulatory, product quality stuff. We, there was like, I don't know, 20 plus features that we checked on these products in the production line. There's a lot of complexity here, but again, all they wanted to do is just verify, hey, your software works or it doesn't. And of course it did. But here's the thing, there was no problems. This this case study was not born of need or problems or issues. It was simply, hey, let's just verify your software works the way we want it to. And when you look at the bottling process, there's a fair amount of complexity here. There's you know, incoming stuff, there's blow molding, there's a quality lab, there's bottle filling and all that. But our focus was, just for the sake of this, was just to focus on the very back end of the process where the actual filling occurred for these bottles. And due to the interest in costs, we did focus a lot of our efforts on what's called net content control. That is how much liquid was being placed into these bottles. So um, that was it. So we, we, uh, there's a whole bunch of the detail that I, I'm not gonna share with you. We're just gonna talk about this net content control thing. So what we did is we helped them to analyze their data and we aggregated it. And there's a critical word I've used in this, this title here and it's aggregated. What that means is that we, we, our software has the ability to roll together lots and lots of data, whether similar or dissimilar, it doesn't matter. Our software has the ability to do that. It's, it's part of the secret sauce. And I wanna show you an example of, an aggr of data aggregation. Now what you see here, this is an enact screen clip of a series of box and whisker plots. Now, I'm a statistician, I know what this stuff is. If you're not a statistician, that's okay. I wanna to explain to you what, this, what these box and whisker plots are. They're very simple. They're basically very compact representations of data. So when you look at, let's take this top of box and whisker. So you'll see there's a middle gray box. What that box represents is the middle half of a data set. Now, the leftmost vertical line on this box, that represents the 25th percentile and the rightmost uh, line on the box represents the 75th percentile. Therefore, what's between the 25th and 75th? Well, that's half of the data set. Now there's a vertical line there in the middle too. That is the median value. And the median value is the point at which half of the data falls above and half of the data falls below. Kind of like think about your median home values in your town or your city where you live. The median home value is the point at which half of the homes cost more and half of the homes cost less. So to the right and to the left of these, of these boxes, there are these horizontal lines. Those are called euphemistically whiskers. So these lines represent, in this case, the top 25% of the data that above, that's above the 75th percentile. And then below the 25th percentile is the other 25% of the data that falls below there. The dots you see on each of these box and whiskers, those dots represent here the smallest and largest data values in the data set. So with that explained, what you're seeing here is data that's been aggregated. So I, what I mean by that is three different features here to begin with. So what we're gonna focus on is net volumes for this distiller, for this uh, bottle of uh, this uh, bottler of spirits. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about that, but watch this, there's also bricks. Now bricks value is a measure of, of uh, sugar content in a product and it's very important you get the sugar content right, it's measured in bricks, blah, blah. It's different from net, val net volume completely, as is torque. The torque here being measured, this is what's really important to this, but was, you know, one of the things important to, the, to all bothers is the cap torque. Now we call it a cap, they call it a closure in that, in that industry, but torque is really important. So what they wanted to do here is say, okay, where are our biggest problems? Let's throw all this data on one chart. It happens to be a bunch of box and whisker plots, but let's put all that data on one chart and see what happens. Well, if you look to the far, you see some statistics here to the right of these, these, uh, these, these uh, categories. And this far right column says percent OOS. That stands for percent out of specifications. So when we look at the bricks box and whisker, you can look at that and say, well, it looks like there's some data values above the upper spec and there's some data values below the lower spec. That's what you see in red there, the specification limits. But we roll it up for you. And X says, hey, look, you've got about 4.5% out of spec for bricks. 
7.6% out of spec for net volume, and for our torques, about 2% are out of spec. So clearly, if we're just talking about prioritizing, we just discovered that <laughs> net volume has higher percent out of spec. So if we're gonna act upon this, we could say, well, look, let's see what additional information might help guide us in how we act on making things better, okay? So the way we could do that is we say, with an act, you can sort and slice and dice the data any way you want. When you see this little plus to the left of a box of whisker, it means you can click it and you can dig down deeper into the data. So when I click that button, what's gonna happen is it's going to drop down some other box of whiskers. Now notice these box of whiskers are kind of gray and these box of whiskers actually roll up to the darker box of whiskers above it. So what this is doing is saying, okay, your net volumes, yes, 7.63% out of spec, but it's showing the percent out of spec and performance for each production line. So again, this word aggregated. You see, we've rolled up data, uh, not just across bricks, net volume, and torque, but we're rolling up data across all the production lines, all the products that are made on those production lines. So well, that's really cool, right? Because now I can see, I can, I can very clearly see that the performance for filling line one doesn't look so great. There's a lot of variability there. There's stuff below lower spec and there's stuff above upper spec. But look at filling line number two. Visually, you can see that it looks like the values are lower and there's some, there's some values below lower spec, but nothing above upper spec. Look at filling lines three and four. You can see that there's nothing out of spec for those filling lines. So if we're just talking about percent out of spec, we can see it over here on the right-hand side. Of the 7.36% out of spec, we know that total out of spec, 17.5% for filling line one. That's likely where we want to, again, apply some, some time and attention because that's a great opportunity for reducing our costs. So if I click this little plus again to the left-hand side, then this will reveal for me how the product codes ran on that filling line. You see, now I've got what's called a three-level box and whisker plot. I can see up top how the net volumes in total performed. Then I can see how each production line, filling line performed. And for filling line number one, I can see how each product code ran on filling line number one. Pretty cool, right? So now I can see, okay, it looks like this 200, 375 uh, 375 milliliter product, it's running low relative to its spec. The soda is running high, the half, half liter is running high. The two liters running high, but the one liter is running eh, a little bit below target, but still in spec. So again, each of these products has totally different specification limits. Each production line is probably running different product codes with different spec limits. The bricks, the net volume, and the torque all have different spec limits but we can make fair comparisons between those because again, the secret sauce that an act brings to the table is not only the ability to aggregate data, but also the ability to make, to, to normalize the data so we can make fair comparisons. So that's why we have one line for the lower spec, one line for the upper spec, because we've normalized the scale. And it's an absolutely brilliant thing, thing to do. So with an act, that's really cool. Um, but I wanted to share with you, it was this kind of analysis that allowed us to, to extract some very interesting information from the data in our, in our spirits bottling example. Let's go to that. Let's talk about what the management wanted. They wanted results. They said, hey, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna you can prove the product is gonna be viable to be used on our production line. Hey, let's look at net content control and let's get our returns on investment there. So again, we had one production line we were working with. There were multiple product codes running across this production line. Uh, there was a rotary filler that had 30, more than 30 heads on the filler. And what we did is every hour, the operator would pull three filled bottles off this filling line and they would weigh them and the software would calculate the volumetric fill based upon the bricks value and blah, blah, all this stuff. So what we're doing, we're saying basically, let's, let's evaluate this bottle. Now I know this is a wine bottle, it's not a spirits bottle, but what we were concerned with was saying, okay, do we have any overfilled bottles? Because this upper specification limit would say, what, what is the max amount of, of volume we could put in each bottle? What was cool about this was that over the period of several weeks, we found that no values were over that upper spec limit. In other words, nothing was unacceptably filled from on the high end. Likewise, we looked at all of these volumetric fills for all those bottles over several weeks, and we found that nothing fell below that, that lower specification limit. And that's really, really important to see that lower specification limit. It represented the, the, 
the expected volumetric fill in this bottle. So if you pick up a bottle of wine that says 750 milliliters on it, it better be it better have at least 750 milliliters in that bottle. And if it has less than that, then that is a failure of the manufacturer to comply with the contract they've stated, which is 750 milliliters. It's actually a big deal. So that is a problem going below lower spec limit. Now, if we were to get another ounce or two of, of wine or spirits in our bottle, we'd be okay with that, but that's cost to the manufacturer. So there's this idea of don't go, don't let it go below, below lower spec, don't let it go above upper spec. And what we found is across these many weeks, nothing was out of spec. So that's really good, right? That's really good. But there's still information to be learned. We learned that there were massive, massive differences between fill heads. Each fill head ran a little higher or lower or differently from the other fill heads. And remember, there's 30 of them to keep track of. And our software did that. We found also there were shift to shift differences that we could deal with. We also found that there were product to product differences. You see, the size of the bottle mattered, whether it's a, a 375 milliliter bottle or a one liter bottle or 750 milliliters, it made a difference. And so also we found this very clearly, operators were afraid of that lower spec limit. They've been told, do not underfill. So guess what? Everything is overfilled. Not above the upper spec limit, but every single bottle had more than was specified as the lower spec. So what happened? Well, <laughs> by, by looking at those, those identified differences, by looking at what we could fix, to make those fill heads more consistent with one another and the shifts to be more consistent with one another and the products, the fills for those bottles to be more consistent, we we're able to identify annual fill volume savings that exceeded $800,000 a year on a single fill line. This is one fill line, one line. And when we presented this information to management, they were dumbfounded. They said, we had no idea how much we were overfilling. Why? because the data was being ignored. It was being gathered, but ignored. We talked about that earlier. Another quote was, we had no idea that fill heads performed so differently. Why? They were ignoring the data. They actually had data fill head to fill head, but they had ignored it for years past. Also, they said, we just, we just didn't have any visibility of this. They had no idea these things were happening. And lastly, they said, they really challenged us and said, how could this be true? Nothing was out of spec. Aha, you see, it doesn't have to be out of spec in order to be a problem. And that's what a lot of a lot of people don't realize. Smart people, they don't realize that just because something out of spec, okay, that, that could say it's bad. But if it's in spec, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best it could be. Right? So the entire team was surprised by the results. It was, this is a brilliant result. And I want to just state very clearly that this is, again, this is just for the sake of verifying that the software worked in the way they wanted it to work. And this is one fill line. This production plant had 27 filling lines, 27. Now you can do the math on that. If they're, if they're overfilling like they were at this production line, you can guarantee yourself they're overfilling on the others. I mean, what we're talking about is potentially tens of millions of dollars of saving annually for one plant. It was extraordinary. And again, they said something similar to me. They said, you know what, Doug? you know more about our manufacturing operations than we do. And again, I called the timeout and said, no, 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 I don't. All I'm doing is sharing with you the information you've just collected and helping you to interpret your own data. In other words, all I did was I helped them to, to use an act as a means of viewing their data through a crystal ball. That's all I did. It was really exciting. It was a great example of just working together and doing some really fun things. Let's go through case study number three. This is a completely different company also. This is a folded carton company. If you don't know what folded cartons are, think about cereal boxes. That is a folded carton. Anytime, anytime you pick up a cereal box, you're actually holding a folded carton. Well, about half of every product you're going to buy in a grocery store is packaged using a folded carton, right? So medications, whatever, it's a folded carton. And this company happened to have multiple production lines. Now, this is one single plant, I should say, one single plant and in uh, a corporation that had 20 plus folded carton plants. Um, this plant made millions of cartons per month. Every month, I mean, these, they were kicking out cartons very quickly. This plant, unfortunately, had the worst quality and the most complaints across all 20 plus plants. And the corporation 
had threatened to shut this plant down if they didn't improve their quality. The reason why is because their three largest clients, three largest customers, were threatening to pull millions and millions of dollars of business away from this plant because their quality was so poor. Here's another problem they had. When I got there, I was talking to the management team, everyone had a different opinion. The plant manager had a different opinion than the maintenance person, then did the operations uh, professional, then did the, the quality engineers. Everyone had different opinions about what was really causing the problems. They didn't have data. They didn't have a, a, a scientific means of identifying where do we start first and how we start fixing things. And that was something we solved for them. Let me start first. With, before we get into this, I wanna share with you what a folded carton is. This is an example of a folded carton. However, this flat piece of, 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 uh, of cardboard, basically, this flat device here is, has really already gone through several manufacturing processes. First, a big roll of this cardboard type material has been sheeted into um, certain sized sheets. Then those sheets, which are white, then they are sent through a printer, which does six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different colors uh, and it, at a very high speed, and it prints these very fancy graphics and such. Then from the printer, these sheets are sent over to cutters and that cut out this type of this type of item. Then once these have been cut, this this these all these things are are sent over to something called a folder gluer that takes this um, this flat bit of material and then folds it and glues it into something that looks like a box, that's what it looks like. So the process looks like this. Now there are three production lines in this plant. Each one had a sheeter, that's the green item. Uh, and then to the right of the, of the green, that's the printing press. So six, seven, eight or 10 color printing press. And then to the right of that was the cutting machine. And then the far right machines, those are what are called folder gluers. And like their, their name, they actually fold, then glue those things. Now. This is the ultimate result of a folded gluer. After all the printing, the sheeting, the cutting, the folding, the gluing, all that, here's the result. Now I want you to take a close, whoops, <laughs> take a close, whoops, look at that. Um, this, this selection, this collection of different um, boxes, folded cartons, notice they're flat. It's very important you recognize that, they're flat. The reason why they're flat is because it's easier to put those into a shipping box. And you can get a whole lot more in a shipping box than if they're popped open, right? And that kind of makes sense, right? That's an efficient way of doing it. So what we did was, because of the opinions, we put in place an acceptance sampling plan where we, we, uh, we staged an, an inspector out on the shop floor, and that inspector would rove from one production line to the left. And before these um, cartons were placed into that corrugated box down below, before that happened, the inspector would check, they'd, they'd take a sampling of boxes and then check to see if there's any defects. Then they'd take those defects and they'd log them with a barcode scanner into the Infinity QS software. And at that point, our software took the data, rolled it all up, and they'd spit out a bunch of reports and charts and graphs for them. So very important, do remember that these things are flat before being placed into this box for shipment. Now, what was the result of that data? Let me just share with you a result. Now, this is an actual screen clip. Now, the, the numbers are different. I've changed them all, but the categories are identical to the defects that were found out on that shop floor. Now, this is the result of, of a week and a half or so of collecting data from the inspector. And uh, what we found was, this is, this is another example of how an act is a, it's a very clever product. It has this really cool ability to aggregate data. Again, I've used that word aggregated here. And the reason why is because all these defects, well, these defects are aggregated across all the production lines and they include defects across all those sub processes that make these folded cartons. And when you look at this, just take a look at the top two bars in the Pareto chart. You see folded flaps as number one and bent damaged flaps as number two. Those are the most frequent defects and they account for nearly half of all defects that were encountered here. And the questions that people started to ask now were, okay, now that we have, instead of opinion, now that we have data and information, what are the sources of these defects? Which products did they occur on? And which production lines are responsible for generating these defects? And those are great questions. 
But let's first take a closer look at, at uh, folded and bent flaps. So you see here this same sort of uh, uh, flat uh, product before it went to the folder gluer. All the things in red, those are flaps. So the questions, we started asking questions and everyone was sitting on their table going, well, why are, the, why are the flaps folded? How could they be bent? Was it shift related? Was it product related? What were the root causes? But one of the things was for sure, the defects were found across all production lines, all processes. And so the question was, well, which, which production line? Let, let's start there. Which production line is generating the most defects? So great, we did that. And here's an example of what we did. This is another example of an aggregated Pareto chart. We call this a multi-level Pareto chart though. And what we mean by that is that this is the exact same data from the Pareto chart you just saw. However, the data has been sorted by production line. And so when you look at this, it looks, it looks a little different, but it's actually the same data. And what we found was that line three generated the most defects. Let's take a look within that red box. You notice there's a, a dark Pareto bar that shows the total number of defects from line number three. But the lighter colored blue bars indicate to you what the defects were and their frequency. And so when you take these, these numbers here for each of the defect codes, you take those numbers and roll them up, add them up, it adds up to 207. So we can see this is actually, guys, this is a Pareto chart within a Pareto chart. See, this is line three. Well, this is line one, this is line two. It's just a Pareto chart within a Pareto chart. It's a very clever chart. We found that the second most defects were found on line number one. So this is critical information by itself that indicates to the quality folks, to the plant manager and everyone else that, hey, if we're gonna start somewhere, let's start on line three. And let's not forget that um, for lines, uh, for, for line three, the most frequent uh, issue was folded flaps. Look at line number one though. The most prevalent defect was bent or damaged flaps. Look at line two, most frequent one was bent damaged flaps. So bent damaged, damaged flaps, they're similar between lines one and two, but folded flaps were unique to line three. So each production line was generating a little bit different types of defects. They're related, but different. So that was very, very interesting. Ultimately, what we're able to do is use the software to identify the source and type and magnitude of those defects. That's how we're able to expose this information. So the defects by line were similar, but watch this. If you notice, there's a defect called carton will not open. And you'll see here that that is the second bar, not just for line three, not just line one, but for all production lines. Carton will not open is a defect that was the second most prevalent defect on every single production line. So that's curious. Remember though, remember that, um, that, that those defects, remember that, that those cartons, however, sorry, I meant to say cartons, those cartons were folded flat before being placed into the shipping boxes. You see, the operators were trying to do their very best on the folder gluers, and they may have been applying a little too much glue, trying to make the boxes nice and strong for their clients, but instead, a little too much glue, and when those boxes get folded down, the glue is getting squished out, and it was, it was gluing the boxes to themselves from the inside. And so what happened was the cartons would not open because they're glued on the inside. That was a problem because those defects were caught by the customer. You see, they, they couldn't see those defects. When the operators originally, when they originally, when the operators just putting his stuff in, in boxes, they would just pick up a bunch of folded cartons that are flat and shove them in the boxes so they could get shipped out. They never, they never were able to see the, the, uh, the boxes wouldn't open because they never tried to open them before placing them into the box. And that was a problem. And unfortunately, again, these are massive problems. If a carton will not open, it'll shut down a, a production line of their customers. Remember this plant only made the folded cartons. When they'd ship these folded cartons off to their customers, well, the customers were the ones that put the cereal in the boxes or the medical product into the box that they just made, the folded carton they just made. Well, if that folded carton, when it gets to the manufacturer, when it gets to them and they can't open the carton, they can't put the product into it, 
That's a problem. It would literally shut down their production lines. So their customers' lines, this, this folded carton plant's customers, their lines were being shut down because cartons wouldn't open because they're glued together from the inside. And when they did that, it would cause between a four and six hour delay because it would jam up their production lines. They were, they were really ticked off about it. And so it was a big, big problem. But here we are. We've just exposed all of this great information. And basically, the primary source of the biggest defects were folded bent, bent uh, flaps and cartons won't open. And both of those critical defects were found on the folder gluers. Now, the, the magnitude of the defects were different from one machine to the next. But basically, they descended upon these folder gluers. They fixed them. And they also had to fix the printers. They also had to fix the cutting machines. They had to fix the sheeters. There are other issues here, but the biggest bars on the Pareto chart had to do with the folder gluers. So what happened? Well, they, they gathered the data and they extracted meaningful information from that, and the information allowed them to completely eliminate their opinion-based decisions, which was really good because it scientifically told them where to go to fix things. Also, their customer complaints, which averaged 100 per month, and I saw the data on this, their customer complaints were completely eliminated within just a month. If they went from 100 a month to zero, and they did that, they fixed the customer complaints within 30 days. And they achieved Six Sigma quality levels on all of their primary characteristics, reduced their overall defect levels by 83% in three months, and then achieved the lowest parts per million defect rate across all 20 plus plants. They literally transitioned that plant's quality from the lowest to the highest throughout the entire corporation in less than three months. Similarly to the other examples, these people said, you know, Doug, you know more about our manufacturing operations than we do. And I said, no, 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 I don't. All I'm doing is using our software as a crystal ball through which we view your data. So I've got a bonus example here. This is another food company, and this company had no product problems. Everything was in spec. They just wanted to do a gap analysis. You see, this company had been using our software for more than a year, and they phoned us up and said, hey, we'd like to have someone come out who can kind of assess what we have done and uh, give us some suggestions for improvement and how we might fix things and how we might better benefit and get greater value from your software. So I went out. I went out. I spent a day and a half there, and we peered into their data using our software as a crystal ball. And because of cost, of cost concerns that they had, we really did, we focused on net weights. I mean, that's that's the cost of a product. When you put it in the package, it's, it's, it's the food itself. That's what costs. And so we, what we did is we just looked at their top 14 product codes. We focused just on 14. Now this plant made 150, 150 different products, but we only foc focused on the top 14. So we gathered up some statistics, which were in our software. We, we gathered up some specification limits, which were in our software. And then we also went through our ERP system because I said, look, if we're going to get some real costs, let's get true costs. So we went to their ERP system and we gathered their per gram raw material weight costs. That is the actual costs they paid their suppliers per gram for, the, for what they needed to make their own products in this plant. And then we created some what-if scenarios based on the information that I that I was able to look at. We said, well, what if what if we could reduce variability in this plant across the board, and what if we could actually reduce those fill weights? And the reason why I asked those questions is because I saw charts like this. Now, this is an example of an individual X control chart. If you're familiar with control charts, then you'll notice that the blue horizontal lines are control limits. The middle blue line is a a, an average line. So we can compare the dots on the chart, the, the plot points, to the average and to the control limits. But you don't even have to look at that. All you have to do is just look at the black line and how it changes and varies and sways from time to time. And that is an indication of variation. Now in manufacturing, as you guys know, variation is the, is the devil. It's, it's the evil out there that we're trying to get rid of. And so we try and eliminate variation. If the idea with, with quality methods and statistical methods in particular is let's minimize variability around the target value. So then that means we can we can make things more consistently. Here we see variation. Here's another example. And by the way, these are exact, these are real charts. These are real screen grabs from their data. Now notice I've I've 
I've, I've stripped out all the identifying information. All we're talking about is net weights here, and that's all, all you really need to know because you can see here there's just a ton of variation. This is an example of one product being made across several days. And we're just looking at net weights. You'll see some net weights are much higher, some are much lower. But look at this. You see this, these two, this section here. There's a lot of variation between the largest and the smallest data value. Likewise, the same is true here. So those look kind of similar, don't they? This, this grandiose change from high to low, high to low, high to low, it's big, big differences in net weights, lots of variation. But then look here. This yellow box indicates, well, quite a bit less variation, as does this yellow box and this one. So these yellow boxes kind of look similar to each other. I mean, it's if you if you were just to kind of you know, just kind of thumbnail it and say, where's the average fall for each of those yellow boxes? The averages would be pretty similar to one another for the yellow boxes. So the average is a little different from the red boxes, as well as the variability is different from the yellow to the red. But look here, look at the green boxes. You can see the same is true there because the averages and the variability is different between the green, the yellow, and the red. And the reason why I color coded the green is because that was better. You see, they, they demonstrated to me they had the ability to have very little variation compared to the yellow and red boxes. So for me, reducing variability is gonna be a pretty simple matter. Here's what we did. We took their data and we monetized it. The far left vertical line represents a lower specification limit. So just think about that as, please do not go to the left of that red line, right? And so we took all their data, we aggregated it, rolled it all up, we normalized it, and we saw that the overall average weight over the period of 12 months, we literally went back 12 months and brought in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of data values to create this kind of analysis. So what we found was that the overall average weight was pretty high, it was pretty far away from that, that lower spec limit you see, that vertical line to the left. And the reason for that was because they had so much variation in their weights. So that's represented by the, the wide, fat, normal curve that you see there. But what I told them was, look, it's gonna be pretty easy for us to reduce variability. And if we did reduce variability, let's say by, I don't know, 40%, then what we could do is we could move that that average line, you see that vertical red line within the normal curve, that represents the average. If we could, we could move the average down some, but notice the leftmost portion of that normal curve doesn't go below that lower specification. So that means that we could reduce the average weight, but still not produce anything below the lower spec. And I said, we could do that, but we could do something even better. We could reduce the variability significantly more than what I originally proposed. And by doing so, we could move that average weight significantly lower than it is today. So when we compare, say, the today and the proposed weights, guys, that was just dollars. That was just money in the bank, and all it had to do with was reducing variation. So here's what we did. We exposed the potential results by reducing variability, our estimates, if we could do that by 25%, we could, we could uh, reduce raw material costs. These are real costs. We could reduce raw material costs by $1.1 million a year for this plant. This is a small plant, right? But if we could, if we could reduce variability by, by two thirds, which was gonna be a layup. This is gonna be simple, easy. By instituting standard uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures, by getting the operators across shifts to talk to one another and, and focusing on being consistent between shifts and, and encouraging the communication that wasn't happening in this plant between shifts, we could easily reduce variability by two thirds. And then again, that was our key. Let's just reduce variation. We really didn't do much more than put in place SOPs, communications protocols, and oversight to make sure this continued to happen. But by reducing variation, the overall weights could be lowered significantly without product falling below the label stated weights. This was a significant, significant improvement. And remember, the $3 million, the greater than the $3 million in savings, that was just for the top 14 products. There were 136 other products we didn't even look at for this analysis, but we knew that the, the process was the same. If we could reduce variability, then you take that 3 million and it's some number larger than that, and um, it was significant. So I'm so excited about these examples of organizations who've really used data from a strategic standpoint. And there are some common themes. I'm gonna start, start summarizing here. 
But in all four cases, one, either, either the company had a big problem and they wanted to address that big problem and they were focused on fixing that big problem or they're just collecting data or they're just trying to make sure that the software worked the way they, the way they wanted it to. But if you're just collecting data, you're not going to see the information that you can see. And by doing so, you can generate huge savings and improvements by looking at data that's in spec. I hope many of you are going, oh boy, this is interesting. I hope you find this interesting. I hope you're thinking to yourself, hey, we've got a lot of data that's in spec. We don't really have a lot of big problems. But if you look at that in spec data, you're going to find like two of these four examples, massive opportunities for improvement. These huge savings were generated also by data that had been ignored, simply not looked at. You know, that, that uh, spirits bottling company, they just didn't know. They were, they were blind to the data because they didn't really take the time to strategically analyze it. Also, these companies, they regularly reviewed data. They acted on the data and the information from that data. Now, your regular review might be once a quarter, might be once a month, might be once a week. Or in the case of the Folded Carton Company, they literally had a management meeting every morning, 6 a.m. for an hour to review the previous day's data so they could act upon it that day. Now, it doesn't have to be daily, but if you'll regularly review, you'll be able to use this data in a transformative way, in a strategic way to make things better. Regularly analyzing data they were already collecting, it did indeed generate transformative improvements. So these companies, another common theme is they used Infinity QS software as a crystal ball for their manufacturing data. So my recommendation to you, please, please stop letting your valuable data die a sad death in some database somewhere. Instead, use our software as a crystal ball for your data. That's, that's what I think you'll find will be massively <laughs> beneficial to your organization. And I've got something for you. I wanna share something that's significant, it's very different, and could be incredibly beneficial for you guys. Next month, we are offering a free Enact subscription to anyone who wants it. That is, these are perpetual licenses. We are offering a free subscription that includes two Enact licenses. That is, if you want to use two licenses of Enact in perpetuity, you can. These are perpetual licenses. No credit card required, no payment whatsoever. Of course, I have to say this, we're, <laughs> we're not a nonprofit organization <laughs> and we never want to be one. <laughs> but, uh, but once you've confirmed that Enact meets your needs, as you enjoy the value that Enact can, can provide to you, and as you expand your use of an act through the use of these two licenses, you'll want to expand your license consumption. And at that point, yeah, we'll go ahead and bill you. <laughs> but until then, you can prove to yourself that an act can make great improvements for your manufacturing environment because you can use it as your own crystal ball for your manufacturing data. Watch your inbox. Wow, Doug, thank you for such a spirited and informative presentation. I hope that everybody's enjoyed themselves. Um, let's see what questions you sparked, Doug. Uh, let's see, here's one. Why couldn't these companies be successful using other technologies? Uh, well, you know what, they, um, they could. I think that other technologies out there uh, could be helpful and allowing organizations to 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 do better to to make to make great improvements i, I do think that's the case and I, I will go back to what i've said before there's much of the quality data i've seen out there much of the manufacturing data that i've, I've viewed out there it's, it's ignored so just simply stopping the, <laughs> the ignoring of data if you just stopped that and actually looked at the data i think you're right I, that's a great question i think that you could actually make some some inroads and improvements I do want to say, though, that our software, it, it, it is indeed a better mousetrap because, and I know everybody probably says that, but ours is because as a statistician, 35 years in my professional career, I've never seen the, the analysis capabilities and the flexibilities and this ability to aggregate data with Infinity QS software. I've never seen it in any other product, and I've... <laughs> I've been exposed to a lot of statistical applications, as you might imagine, in my life, and I've never seen it before. So this, the secret sauce I've talked about, the secret sauce of aggregating data and then normalizing scales and then sorting, slicing, dicing data, 
it is indeed a significant difference we bring to the table. And there's a whole bunch of other things that I think that are different, but just those things there will make it very easy for you as organizations to interrogate your data. I like to use that. Take the data, regularly review it, but interrogate it. Use our, our tools to sort, slice, dice the data so you reveal that information that you didn't necessarily know was there. All right, great answer. I have one more question. Uh, how are these companies different from other companies and why were they so successful? Um, yeah, so, okay. So I think that the, the two examples where I shared with you where there's problems, big problems, I think that that tends to focus an organization, organization's collective mind. The reason why I say that is because, look, if, if someone is threatening to shut your plant down, like corporate was with that folded carton plant, by the way, um, they saved that plant from closing. And um, it wasn't just that they improved their quality so much, they saved that plant from closing. And the plant manager moved on to several plants over and over, different plants, and replicated the success throughout that organization. That was very exciting for, for that person and for the, the teams that worked with them. But, but yeah, it's, they're different because highly focused, backs against the wall, we got to do something, we got to do it now. And that, I think that, you know, for any of us, personally or professionally, if our backs are against the wall, we're going to respond and we're going to make it happen. So I think that is indeed true. But Laura, for the other two, it was a matter of being coached um, the, the, and, and, and having the intellectual curiosity about the data that they are gathering to say, hey, wonder, wonder what we can learn here. And I say intellectual curiosity because I've, I've been exposed to some wonderful people in my 25 year career here at Infinity QS. On our client side, I've been exposed to people who are just brilliant people who are fascinated with, with, with getting better, who don't feel right about their day unless they're continually moving forward, incrementally making better and better their organization. And that is, that is uh, wonderful to see. So I think it really has to do with so, sometimes there's an internal motivation that people have, an intellectual curiosity, I called it. But also it doesn't have to be a manager. It doesn't have to be a leader or a vice president. I've seen companies massively benefit from one person who just said, you know what? It, a low level person like an operator who said, I'm going to fix things. I'm going to make things better. I'm going to expose some improvement opportunities to this business. And I want to try and replicate that across the plants or the plants because I just really enjoy doing that. And so I think that's, sorry, that's probably too long of an answer to your question, but that's the way <laughs> I'd answer it. <laughs> no, no, that was perfect. That was perfect. Um, all right, well, I think that we are out of time. And uh, Doug, this has been so educational. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, thank you for attending. Like I said before, we'll be sending out an email containing the recording playback soon. If you'd like to get in touch with Doug to learn more, uh, you can visit, send him an email or visit his LinkedIn page. He will respond to emails. Don't be afraid to email him. Um, again, Doug, many thanks for that spirited and informative discussion. And special thanks to everybody for joining us today. Enjoy the rest yes. of your week. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Yep. Thanks, Doug. Bye.